I thought I'd kick it off by asking each of the panellists to answer one of my questions, because I haven't had a chance to answer, ask a question yet today. Um, and then we'll open it out to the floor and, um, and get um, all of your questions um, for, for the whole panel. Um, Ruth will be running around with this microphone, so it would be nice to her. Um, but um, we've obviously heard about capacity building from various different aspects this afternoon. And I wanted to ask each of you, what's the number one thing that you would like to see happen um, that you think will, will build the most capacity um, for research, scholarly communication and open access to, or access to that um, in the next year? So we'll start with Jonathan, since he's next to me. Okay. Right, do, do we have to that one? No, it's fine. Okay. Um, I think that the entire premise of my presentation was there isn't one thing we can do, uh, but um, and it's much more complicated and uh, multifaceted. But if I was uh, pushed to say one thing which I think is overlooked, it would be to um, look at um, research in undergraduate education um, because that's the kind of pipeline and that's where the capacity to sort of handle research literature, understand what it is, interrogate it, use it, it's going to be built. Um, for, for me, I, I think it is an intrinsic acknowledgement by institutions that if research is part of your core business, then communicating that research is also part of your core business. Um, at a national level, an acknowledgement that research communication has a role to play in achieving the Millennium Development Goals. This is an extraordinarily difficult question because I, I echo John, it's all of the threads in the fabric need to be worked on and lifted up at the same time. Um, pie in the sky number one would be for African governments to really start putting in a huge amount more resources into research and higher education and scholarly communication. Don't think that's going to happen next year. Um, but yes, um, university institutions um, and governments uh, recognizing the critical importance of scholarly communication, collaboration um, as an essential part of higher education, with higher education being acknowledged as essential for economic development, poverty alleviation. Um, I think that we still need to do a lot more advocacy because some researchers still do not think that uh, open access, you know, avenue is good enough. They look at open as free and we need to let them know that we have to draw a line between free access and open access so that uh, whatever they do, their works, they will, be, they will willingly put them out there in the open access uh, uh, facilities. And by this, I will also want that governments should insist that when you res uh, fund research, there is that caveat that you are funding the research and you need to publish it in open access events. I've got one more question before I let go of the microphone, um, which is um, based on, on what Jonathan said about the fact that um, open access or free access is often seen as not high quality or you know, if it's free it can't be very good. What can we as publishers do um, to combat that and to get the message out to um, institutions and to the powers that be that this is high quality research, it's just made available to people through different means? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I think university leaders got to be engaged, though. So vice chancellors and um, DVCs and deans of research, um, it's got to be on their um, on their radar. But I think a lot of the change, I think most academic change doesn't really come from kind of top down and sort of dictates. It comes from what other academics do and their peers. And um, so I think it's probably more of a it's a kind of 
peer encouragement and awareness, but supported by the right kind of institutional policies, which means if they want to do it, it's recognised, um, it's encouraged. Sure. That is a, a very difficult question. Uh, I, I feel like the, the idea of quality needs to be interrogated in our own context for us on what we decide we want quality to mean and that maybe we need to differentiate between rigor and a different sense of quality because it feels like we need um, rigorous, sensible, responsive research and I think a lot of that isn't finding um, any place because of other indicators which are perhaps superficial which um, I'm, I'm an ex-editor, so I'm, I'm saying this very carefully. Language is very important, but um, minor superficialities in language shouldn't be a barrier or a, a principal defining feature of what we think of as valuable um, and as being quality. Um, that feels like an important idea for us to set some standards of what we, how we're going to define quality for ourselves in terms of research getting out there. I go back to the point that I was making about the difficulties with making generalizations. And what we see in Agile is that 40% 40, 40 of our repeat users, a million odd repeat users um, in the past year are from Africa. And the majority of downloads from the open access journals on Agile are going to Africa as a continent. So there is certainly demand for open access peer review journals coming out of the continent. And definitely there remains a need for advocacy myth busting to uh, some researchers who might have uh, misperceptions about what open access means and uh, the idea that paying for something means that it's high quality and paying even more means it's even better quality. Um, but I think that that's probably true uh, of many researchers in developed countries as, as, as much as it is for researchers from Africa. Um, thanks. Um, from the, the publishers, and I think, uh, you know, it would be a little difficult for a publisher to say, okay, I'm publishing open access, so it's good. I mean, people will think you are selling your own stuff, but I think that <coughs> libraries should come out and do that, because in my own institution, we sort of gathered statistics uh, from both open access uh, journals, they use it, citation, citation statistics, and we showed our institution that you see, don't think that open access uh, avenues or journals are not really good. Look at how many people have cited this. And look at also how they cite uh, commercial uh, publishers. So that was what helped for them to now look at open access, uh, at, I mean, staff who uh, publish in open access journals. They now look at their papers as good. So I think it's, it's statistics, but not from the publishers. And you may not be taken seriously. They will think it's a gimmick, you know, for, your, for people to think positively towards you. In the work we've done, we've seen consistently that the ideas around quality can't be separated from confidence. And it's, it's an enormous factor for the academics who we've been interacting with. Um, an extreme twitchiness about what the rest of the world is going to think that it seems to us that northern scholars just don't have the same levels of anxiety about the whole rest of the world peering down their noses at you some very deep, deep confidence issues, it feels like, in our universities and in our scholarship that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. For academics to feel this sense of confidence of, it doesn't matter what the formatting is, it's the data that's important it needs to get out there. That's a, a big challenge for us, um, for academics and institutions to have the sense of confidence in their work and in themselves. Okay, so we can start the questions from the floor. You're going to think this is a crazy question, but it happened to me once. 
So I want to ask you what you would do if this happened to you. If a funder phoned you up and said, look, we've come to the end of a program cycle, we've got some money left over, about 250,000 US dollars, we've got to spend it in the next two years, and we need a proposal from you at the end of the month. What would you spend it on? For me, is it for all of us? That's sneaky. Are you, are you going to stand there? <laughs> Thanks, that would be better. Let me try and encapsulate our five year plans into two. <laughs> Um, one of the aspects that uh, I think that Agile specifically would like um, to roll out is um, increased functionality and our own ability to capture old metrics um, because I think that what a lot of people need in order for them to be convinced of quality of open access journals in Africa is number proof. Um, so we're working on that already um, and then analyzing that, writing it up, sharing it, disseminating it, advocacy for open access and awareness raising of the work that is already being done, the acceptance levels and the quality levels of what already is out there in terms of open access publishing in Africa. Have a go. Um, I, I, th I think an idea, uh, a project or an initiative that would support the idea of regional collaboration around publishing. It feels like for that amount of money it would just be an insignificant drop if, if utilized in one institution and that seems to be what we're seeing consistently. Very small institutions with enormous problems all trying to battle with this mammoth thing themselves. And we keep coming back to the idea that a regional solution feels so compelling that we need to share that problem around. So if resources could go towards starting something that shared that problem around and move towards ideas like regional mega journals, that seems like it would be a very good use of resources. Um, what I'll do is that uh, I'll propose to buy a bigger memory server and then carry out all the activities I have to go through to ensure that we really have a national repository. By this I mean that finding, uh, going to these various uh, government ministries and other places to ensure that I'm able to collect what they have to populate the national uh, repository and in essence to also support the open access Journal that we are publishing. Most um, things I can think of would take more than two years to, uh, to do. So, I mean, there are a few things I think would benefit from some more funding. I think um, program work around supporting early career scholars because that's the next generation. That's that's what we're actually going to. Have some traction, I'm going to have to have some traction. Um, but in two years, maybe that's not. Maybe in two years, you can do something useful about engaging leadership around these questions and getting them to um, not just in a kind of broadcast mode and trying to get them to adhere to some particular um, policies or buy into a certain narrative, but to debate and discuss and work out as. Uh, as regional university leaders, what this means for them, where they take it. Otherwise, they'll be um, on the back foot responding to things being um, sort of led by research council in the north. You know, things like the Finch Report will have a big, a big, um, big impact. But you know, their their ability to feel kind of confident about 
setting your contribution to the agenda themselves, I think. Thanks. I would just like to endorse uh, what Michelle was saying about um, a project to strengthen collaboration between the initiatives that are already happening. Um, and, and linking that to the confidence levels that exist um, within our higher education community um, in general, possibly. Um, and using the, that predatory open access publishers list as an example, um, so many African librarians see one individual who's come up with a list of predatory open access publishers and treat it as gospel um, because it's, it's from the north and don't interrogate it and make up their own minds um, about whether or not that publisher is addressing the needs as exist in the actual context in which we operate and whether or not those standards are actually appropriate for the context in which we operate. So definitely a regional collaboration to get us talking to each other far more actively and open up the spaces for that to happen because we're all so busy in meeting the needs that we are mandated to do that we're forgetting about the, the very powerful impact that group effort can have. Two questions, one what, what for Michelle and one for Susan. Uh, Michelle, you, you, you seem to be ambivalent in what you say about quality. Uh, and, and, and I mean, it's slightly worrying uh, in some ways, you're talking about different, different criteria, different rigour. Um, and you're saying, well, let's go for relevance rather than uh, prestige and excellence. And, uh, um, and that, that does, does concern me because I, I, uh, I, I, double standards is, is, is a tricky one and I feel that's what you, you're saying. I mean, in some ways it reminds me of the debate between uh, uh, applied research and, uh, and fundamental research and uh, the best answer I heard was good applied research is fundamental research. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, uh, <coughs> Maybe you can elaborate on that. Uh, my question to Susan is that uh, in your in your um, uh, African journal uh, online, we, we talked about language. Um, what, how do you deal with uh, French, uh, Spanish, uh, Portuguese uh, uh, journals? And uh, 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 I mean, do, do you how, the, the, the motivation for having those national language journals, or, or maybe even some Swahili or uh, Arabic, uh, uh, this also represents Africa. And uh, how it's a, diff it's a difficult issue to cope with. And I just wonder how you how you do. So I'll, I'll start in terms of the the quality issue. Um, I think my my point is primarily one about let's just get up there and get started rather than waiting to have the perfect, neatly manicured resource that is the ideal shopfront piece of display. Um, I, I don't want to detract from the need for quality or, or rigor at all. And you know, we had a, a case where we had a very um, valuable resource at UCT that we wanted to share. It had been used for decades, literally. It was one of those handed down and evolved teaching resources, and all that we had was a really skew scan. And we had hours of debate over whether we should use this thing or not, and what it would say about the directory and the prestige of the institution. People didn't care whether it was skew. It was an incredibly valuable resource that had been used for 20 years, and people wanted to have it out there. And we're seeing something similar in our other institutions we're working with, this, this real need of, we're gonna expose ourselves to the world wait, we're not ready, we're not ready, we have to have this perfect piece of research that we can put out there to, to share that's going to be the definitive projection of ourselves. That, I think, is what I'm, I'm trying to counter against, rather than anything intrinsically within the research process. Can I speak to that question for Michelle very quickly before I move on to the language one? Um, not to put too blunt a point on it, but I'm 
not necessarily thinking that the rigor of the research is in question. I think that it, this, this cosmetic finessing aspect is the quality area that is being debated and a misperception that when that is missing, the rigor of the research is missing also. So it's like me waking up in the morning with no makeup, I still have the same skills as I do after I've put on my face. <laughs> So, not that I wear much. <laughs> moving on to, <laughs> moving on to um, the question for Angel. Um, yes, Helena yeah. said to me, you'll be doing a lot of speaking now, even though you were short in your presentation, because I don't tend to talk a lot, apologies. Um, there are journals that are Kiswahili song language journals on Angel. Um, there are journals that are Seoul Arabic, there are journals that are Seoul French. Um, we also try to raise awareness amongst journals that for their online version, space isn't an issue because the cost of space online is negligible compared to printing. So they can have multiple versions in multiple languages of their articles if they are able to provide them. And we encourage that where possible. Um, one of the beauties of open journal systems that the amended software that we use and that we make available to the journals is that it has language locales that you can use to actually have all the instructions in the language of your choice. And we've had the whole of HL translated into French. Um, so we're going to be, hopefully, we'll, we were planning this for, in fact, last year already, and we haven't managed to implement it yet. But hopefully next year we'll be having a, a French version of HL because that is an area that we are actually very underrepresented on. Um, we're underrepresented on South African journals because most of our work is with um, countries in the rest of Africa that are less well resourced in terms of their communication um, infrastructure and we're underrepresented on Francophone journals. Um, I, I just wanted to raise a particular point and uh, the, the a mention was made of predatory journals but uh, predatory can be, um, uh, can be interpreted in many ways. Now for instance the waiver of funds for authors by um, um, open source journals, uh, in fact, is, is a predatory move because the, author, the authors uh, then don't want to publish in the local journals, which may need to, to charge in order to, 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 be, to be able to publish in them. So, uh, it, uh, and, and in fact, it, it strips uh, many of the local journals from their best contributors, which again, uh, reduces the uh, impact of, of the local journals. So uh, one of the ways in which one needs to deal with that is that very few countries recognize that part of research uh, or that needs to be funded is, is the publication uh, of that. And uh, it may be that in a country like South Africa, one needs a dedicated fund to, in fact, uh, fund the journals uh, who, uh, uh, or rather the, the authors uh, directly to the journals rather than uh, you know, trying to access that from the authors uh, themselves. Do you, uh, I think you should. Okay. I can talk afterwards. Um, the summit we discussed, I discussed earlier in my presentation, um, one of the reasons we set that up was specifically to try and look at how we could address that problem, um, which is that we recognised that offering waivers it became very clear in our Open Access Africa conference last year that um, loss and biomedical offering waivers is actually a problem for African journals, and we wanted to. Um, do something about that, and so we set up the summit meeting, and we're looking at, at and the, the summit was um, a whole lot of funding agencies and editors and publishers and most of the people in, in the, on the panel um, looking at solutions for that, and, and we haven't come up with a solution yet, but we're, we've, we've come up with some ideas and we're, we're hoping to move that forward, and, and indeed trying to find funds which can directly fund the, that research so that it can get published, whether it's funding an African journal so that the authors don't need to um, pay APCs, or whether it's funding them to publish in open access journals 
wherever they want to. Um, those were some of the discussions that, that we discussed, that we came up with. Um, we, one of the issues that was raised is you don't want to limit authors, um, whatever solution you come up with, you don't want to limit authors to where they can publish because that then causes the problem somewhere else. Um, but we do recognize this problem, we do want to try and address it. Susan, did you also want to? I think in, in both this sense of predatory publisher that JP raises now and in the ones that uh, were mentioned by Marcel and myself um, earlier, um, when you drill down and interact um, with the, those publishers involved, I think that what I certainly have discovered that there is a huge amount of goodwill there and best of intentions and, and a, a, a real desire to proactively try and offset any kind of negative effects um, such as uh, the, the one that you raised and, and as evidenced by this, this very meeting now uh, by, by Met Central. Um, and, and the same, I'm hoping, is true of, of the other uh, publisher that I mentioned earlier, uh, Academic Journals, and I'm hoping that um, we can kind of reach out to them actively next year, um, Agile and Kofi ENC as well. I'd like to say something. Um, I sometimes feel really sorry for anybody who tries to do any work with Africa. Because you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. I mean, the, the, the politics and the, the power dynamics are so, so deeply rooted and it, it becomes very difficult to know which way do you walk so that you don't offend or so that you do keep the equity. And for me, it just keeps coming back to our very own reward and incentive systems. You know, when we looked at, uh, there was a wave probably about 10 years ago of local content. There was the idea that you had to once every hour you had to pay a local song on a radio and until our reward and incentive systems drive at addressing local publishing and supporting local publishing in how we channel funds in how we reward our researchers feels like those global power we will always just be victim to the global power dynamic and to somebody else's agenda <coughs> I think it depends on the, on the institution. For instance, in my institution, they want a mixture. You don't have to publish everything in the local journal. And you don't also have to publish uh, completely in the foreign journals. But then, they will want a mixture because uh, they claim that makes you international, that uh, your research has gone international. But going international does not mean you should also forget your so your local environment. So it's, it's a mixture. And I think that is what we really have to look at. Because it's these uh, avenues which make you relevant in your home and also relevant outside. Um, I can I say one more thing about that is that there have been a couple of surveys of authors worldwide recently about what is it that um, makes them choose the journals that they choose to publish in. And um, the top factors that come out in all of these surveys are um, the quality of the journal, um, the impact of the journal, doesn't necessarily mean impact factor, but how much um, it's noticed within the community they work in, and the readership, who, who reads it, where does it get to. Um, whether or not it's open access is, is a way down compared to um, what that journal stands for. And so I think also the, um, the journals that, that you're talking about in terms of African journals need to also make sure that they're reaching out to the community, the community wants to publish in them, and then we need to find ways of enabling them to do so without um, you know, our policies getting in the way. I think for the first question, I think it's a matter of time. Open access journals have been on the market for some time now. But even the established journals didn't get their names and excitations regularly until a lot of time was spent that people recognize the existence and use it. So I think with time, our open access journals will be identified and used by our researchers and writers and all those kind of group of people. 
So I think we should not worry much. What we must worry much about is to get more information published in our open access journals. And if it are there, you can see how people will make use of them. Then again, the second question that was asked, if there is fund available, how do you make yourself know so that the funds will be accessible to you? And my question, the response is that it depends on capacity only. If you have people with the knowledge, content knowledge and skills in research, then when such an issue arises, it is easy to rely on those people, prepare your proposal, submit your collect the money, and you can accept. So two things are important here. You should not worry about whoever finds out our articles in the open. Put them there. When people know that the topic you have discussed is significant to what they are doing, they will go there and take the information very well science us. That's what and the last thing. Capacity building, once we have got the right people with the right knowledge and skills to do the research, you'll be able to access funding and do our research professionally. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to wanted to consider the issue of waiver, uh, which um, is coming uh, in terms of our first publishing. Um, South Africa is not on the list of countries that uh, get uh, the rebate to a waiver. But there is a big challenge uh, in the sense that there aren't too many funders in South Africa who would fund authors um, uh, publishing if it's not already in the research uh, grant. And that's a challenge because um, how do we um, get our authors or our researchers to publish the open access journals if they don't have money to pay the uh, required fee? Um, and um, the research, some research offices obviously uh, don't have extra money to put into such publishing and it's used in the libraries are not able to subsidize publishing documents the journals. Where we have that dilemma um, right now. Uh, because it will increase our cost if the essence of open access is to reduce costs. On one hand, uh, amongst others, uh, it looks like cost is gonna is, is gonna build up as long as we hold some of the um, gated journals, except we drop them and use the money to pay uh, towards uh, publishing in open access journals. But I think it's an issue that we need to address. South Africa sits at the crossroads, I would say. Thank you. I, I realize that we're in an Africa-wide forum here, but in the South African context, there is such an enormous elephant in the room whenever we have these conversations, which is our publication subsidy system. Um, it, it has um, caused an enormous obstacle for us in, in publishing. And I don't know if everybody knows about and understands the South African publication subsidy system. Um, if you're based at an uh, accredited university and you, can, you publish a research article on an accredited list, which is either the ISI list or a South African Department of Higher Education list, you receive a publication subsidy. Well, your institution does. Um, that's, and um, if anybody can correct me, but um, my current understanding is that that is just under 200,000 Rand per journal article. And the publication su subsidy system entrenches a lot of what is deeply rotten with our publishing industry and scholarly communication in our country. But we also can't help thinking whether we've, we've got this, this monster, how can we make it work for us? and seen as how we have a mechanism that's at work in our country, could the publication subsidy system be used as a mechanism that can carry an article processing charge component as part of it? That, that feels to me like an interesting, important question and issue to deal with. Outside of South Africa, um, I also think that it's quite important for, for researchers and research officers to realize that one of the core costs of conducting research needs to be the cost of dissemination. And if you're a chemical researcher, just as much as you need to budget for the chemicals that you need for your research, 
you also need to budget for the APC, the article processing charge, so that you can get that research published where it, it needs to be published. In fact, it's even part of academic freedom because otherwise you as the researcher are not able to choose the journal that you want to publish in unless you have yourself included that into your budgeting process. So this is one of the points that we were making earlier about how research dissemination needs to be refocused as a core intrinsic part of the research process and not just as a separate after the fact we'll think about it sometime when we're ready. And I think that that can, you know, that, that, that'll take a while to change because there are institutional systems in place and we all know that academics are not the quickest to <laughs> shift uh, in terms of adapting to new systems. But um, that's one of the parts of the response that I wanted to make. The second part is that um, one of the highly successful uh, open access journal publishers uh, that Agile works with has actually found they, they've been open access and they weren't charging article processing charges and now they are charging article processing charges and they didn't notice a drop in the number of, of submissions and they have also heard from some researchers that might be that they might be wanting to approach to have their work published in, the, in this journal that they would rather save up and have for the article processing charges for some other preferred, more prestigious journal elsewhere than publish in the, the journal in Africa that charges article processing charges or even an equivalent to article processing charge. So in some cases, bearing in mind again the vast degree of heterogeneity here, in some cases the money is not the constraint. Skip back on actually to, um, to Eve's comment about um, about excellence um, and quality. I think um, I think there's a there's a big danger at the moment in the, the debate about world class and sense of excellence and, and and excellence in higher education becomes a very much more elite concern. Um, shuts people out, shuts universities out, and I think there's a real need to try and reclaim some of the conversation about higher education and what it's for um, to kind of not only counter this kind of chasing of rankings, maybe you can't do that, but at, but at, but at least to build richer understanding of ways in which you demonstrate your public value, your social value. Um, because I think um, If you look at most university statements now, they'll have something about being, uh, being world class, being a world top institution. Um, and obviously, in any system, only a fraction of universities ever can be the top. Um, I think within the continent, there's a, a danger that um, there'll be some universities which, which do progressively rise up the rankings and do appear in those lists, but they'll just be continental tip of the iceberg um, and if we really want to build research capacity um, and teaching capacity and educational capacity it's got to be much much wider than that and I think there's a real need to kind of reclaim some of that um, um, conversation around valuing higher education and it's not just the I mean lots of lots of the activity at the moment which is designed to build research capacity um, is working with a very small minority of institutions um, and there are good reasons for that you have to start somewhere you have to have a basic level um, of capacity to be able to um, take in your investments um, to do more work but I mean it, the, the explosion of undergraduate teaching and the number of universities every time um, I travel somewhere there are more universities since the last time I went there um, and they'll be missed out I think if, if there's this a continued fixation on places in the, um, in the lead tables. Sorry. Following on from what John was saying, um, one of the benefits, it's a disadvantage and a benefit, but the benefit side of Agile working directly with journals instead of with university institutions or uh, research institutions and indirectly to the journals. 
um, is that we are able to work with pockets of capacity and pockets of will. And I think that the, that the will, the political will, or just the drivers, the champions the, in, in an individual department um, can radically change um, sort of from, from downwards upwards uh, the progress of, of an entire department, an entire publication, an entire university, an entire country. Um, so I think that, that yes, you've got to start somewhere, but often it's at a kind of a more granular level than with an, with an institution or with the country's um, decision makers and, and lawmakers. What kind of other capacity building channels could be explored? It looks like we've been uh, working quite well building capacities among libraries, library consortium, perhaps university administrators to some extent, or university consortium uh, among publishers. So should we be looking at other partners like? Uh, if, if we speak about regional projects, uh, like perhaps research societies, uh, academies of sciences, uh, I know that ASAF, South Africa, Uganda perhaps are doing okay, but other academies of sciences on the continent are quite passive. Then perhaps should we look at uh, journalists who write about science uh, in uh, our daily media, and again, South Africa is perhaps a good example Ghana, Tanzania, perhaps, is a good example, but not other countries on the continent. And uh, whether we could explore some partnerships with uh, non-governmental organizations and people who, uh, with some, I don't know, special diseases, for example, with patients groups. Do you, do you think any future in this kind of partnership? Because usually you, you don't have time for that, if, in case you have time, in case you can work 48 hours a day. Yes. <laughs> you said it very well, Irina. All, all of those things that you mentioned, that, that broad spectrum feels important. Yeah, um, I think that's a great point. Uh, but most times, I believe that uh, you also have to look at what works within the country. In some countries, you may get the media coming in, and they are a good source for, because they really push out a lot of information. But in some areas too, they may not. So you look at the, the geography or the environment in the country, but I can also add that even parliamentarians, because when you go to some of, they have the educational select committee in my country, and then they also do a lot of work. So if they, for instance, understand what open access is, it's easier for them to look at the budget from some of these mini ministries and then push it. So like I said, you look at the situation in the country, and based on that, you know the people you are going to add on to the number of people that uh, you have mentioned. But I think it's very good. We've been talking to librarians, researchers. I think it's a lot. Let's go out and talk to the policy makers, the government officials. They also all have, that means, sticks, and they can also influence how people will take on open access. And I think you're absolutely right, there's, there's an awful lot more work that can be done, lots of other groups could be, uh, could be involved, but you know, adopt a slightly contrary position to, um, uh, I think that even though there's been lots of work with librarians and researchers, um, that doesn't mean that the conversations are happening between them in the institution. So I think there's, there's still an awful lot of work to be done to um, join up some of those threads, um, because it always, it always is, astonishes me um, um, how hard it is for librarians to get into conversations with their academics um, and how little academics often understand what's going on in the library and their participation in some of these um, types of initiatives and um, repositories and um, etc. So I think there's a real need to, to kind of stitch together some of that activity on an institutional basis. And I would say that coming from a university body, but um, but I think um, lots of the problems which still need to be solved, um, the capacity exists, but it's about coordinating it, pulling it, 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 it together and making those conversations happen. Um, I 
I think there's also an important component of capacity development within institutions that we have to establish some brand new capacity and spaces in the institutions that we're working with. Um, speaking from experience in the context that we're in, we keep seeing a big gap, a hole in the middle of the institution where there's a, a need for an entity to respond to what's going on out there, but nobody's quite sure who or what that entity is. So is it an Office of Scholarly Communication? Is it a um, some other kind of entity, whatever you might call it, because the library is crucial, and so is the, the IT, ICTS sector, and so is the research office. But what is the entity? What are the, the governance structures? How are we developing the capacity of the governance structures to be able to strategically manage this new enterprise? That, that holistic role <coughs> seems to be really crucial. I'm Kay Rasbrooka, retired librarian. <laughs> I just wanted to, to remind us that one of the presenters today talked about the African condition, which is basically that at one time we lost out on universities' importance. Then we brought you in and we said, okay, well banked told us teaching and learning. So we got into information literacy and all of that stuff. And the academics who had more or less lost out on research, and even South Africa, if you remember, that it had been had the apartheid times, and so they didn't have enough research um, information. So in that sense, South Africa and the rest of Africa with um, the World Bank and IMF issues, we all are in the same port in that, in that aspect. So we have now, we had a le teaching and learning and our academics or our colleagues started working on this. Then came in the research and of course we were all catching up, there was IT and all of now, I'd also like to, to remind us of the comment that came up that says, basically, research is very important for MDGs. If as nations, developed nations, we're going to address all of the ills and the problems that are facing us as developing countries. But the people who are talking to right now, the researchers, are passing on. The people that are left are this group, are the matriculants, and if you are looking at the South African um, news and the education system, they have fallen back to be the last in, in whatever, and I can assure you, they were our best. I will exclude Ghana, I don't know enough about it, but SADC, South Africa was our best in terms of the, um, the intelligence and the people that are getting into, into tertiary education. What are, we, what are we saying about the passing researchers who are retiring or I will lack the energy to do it? Is it not the time that we should be saying, well, how can we help I would say even secondary schools, because that's where it starts. So to stop the regurgitation, the memorization, which when you get to university, first year lecturers tell you, those who are teaching, say, there is no way I can even ask them to research anything. It's best to give them notes. And then, of course, there are textbooks and plagiarism, etc., etc. So I'm unsane. Shouldn't we be looking at our context and the point of research and how we can change the entire system, particularly that Africa is really so steeped in the oral tradition, which is another factor of context that we have got to think about and its impact on the learning systems. 
It's just an idea that I just think that we all need to look deeper than look at the people who are now doing research. Just as a last point, um, John talked about Mamdani's quotation and consultants and researchers. And I want to just throw in, I'm not a Mamdani, I'm not a professor, I'm just a librarian, even though I always say I'm not, you know, the word just a librarian is wrong. I am a librarian. The point is, consultancies address practical issues and they make a difference at HIV level. When everybody else is talking about the theory, I mean, you know, looking at it, at a further point of view that when we will present it and we'll discuss it at conference and the cycle of coming back to application takes so long that people have had it. Thank you. Um, I'm very sensitive to that um, issue of uh, But what I was trying to, I think what I think what he was trying to draw attention to, and what I do think is important, is that um, the crux of his particular quote there was that it's 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 not about whether research is applied or, ba um, applied or basic, or whether it's um, um, academic and scholarly, or trying to address development questions. It was more about who is deciding on question in the first place um, and a lot of that consultancy work um, is obviously funded by um, the international NGOs and agencies um, and it's all it all had a very um, uh, important um, agenda to answer important questions um, and address real needs but if there's a, a generation of academics who are who are always trained to respond to somebody else's question and are never trained to step back and work out what the question is for themselves, then African academics are going to be in a, a worse situation for it, I think. Um, so th there needs to be, like, for most of these things, there's got to be some kind of balance. It's, it's neither one nor the other. There's still an important role for consultancy. Um, it brings academics into contact with um, the world around them. NGOs, with society, with people, with these problems, but if they're, if they end up only answering questions set by somebody in an NGO or in a donor agency in the north, that's not really going to help the future of critical research, which is what's going to be able to answer these questions and um, the issues of relevance for years and decades to come, I think. But it's a balance, obviously. You know, the, um, the most downloaded article um, from HR last year was um, an article in South African Journal of Education about the crisis in South African schooling. The, it is of huge concern, the, the, the younger researchers coming into tertiary education. Um, and if I may venture out on a limb and express my own personal opinion on this, outcomes-based education was adopted by the South African Department of Education for its schooling system. And that was a result of an enormous amount of money done to look at the rest of the world and try and figure out what was the most appropriate system for South Africa to then take on. It was taking a system from elsewhere and applying it here, and it was an abject failure, as an entire generation of scholars has now learned. <laughs> um, and I think that the fundamental lesson to take out of that, as with much of the rest of our discussions, is that one valid generalization for us to make about ourselves in Africa is to stop being so responsive and to stop looking elsewhere for the solutions. I think that the case studies, the examples of 
huge successes in meeting the challenges that we have. One thing that they all have in common is they are very proactive. And they do it for themselves. They decide on their own solutions and implement them in an extremely active, proactive fashion. Excuse me. I thought John would only talk about this uh, early career researchers, you know, in response to what Kay said about the old researchers moving on and needing to. I think there are several programs ongoing where um, younger staff or faculty and researchers are being trained to do effective research. So I think that is something which, uh, if others latch on, we can uh, make sure that uh, there are lots of younger ones coming in to continue the research. But I want, this morning, someone asked something about how we're going to get the traditional medicines. And now, uh, for in Ghana, we have a department in the university, uh, Department of Herbal Medicine. And that department brings out graduates who now go out and work with these uh, people, traditional uh, African medicine. What I think we need to do is to encourage them to publish. The battery is gone. What we need to is to encourage them to publish um, what they have seen. But the other side is the fact that if those people they are working with, the, the, the traditional healers, if they get to know that they are also bringing out this information to the world, they will virtually refuse to work with them. Because it's something like a, a secret. They don't want to know. So we are, you know, neither here nor there, but we are hoping that with time, before these healers die with the knowledge, we'll be able to get that information through these graduates of herbal medicine who are now working with them. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. So I think this is a fascinating discussion, and we could go on for many hours, but um, unfortunately we do have to bring it to a close, but part of, I think, the reason for bringing everyone together is to, to start this discussion, and we hope this isn't, you know, this is only the beginning of a discussion like this, and we hope you'll continue it over drinks, which are going to be outside in a couple of minutes. Um, I just want to say to you, thank you very, very much to the panel, um, both for your presentations and for your really interesting insights during, during the panel discussion. Thank you very much to the audience for, for being so engaged and, um, and for being here on a Sunday. Um, and um, to say that we're starting again tomorrow morning on a prompt at 9.30. Um, there's a couple of changes to the program, um, and so it's not exactly as you see it, um, but there's even more interesting things coming tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, and um, thank you very much. We'll see you outside now.